Good afternoon. Uh, let's maybe establish some parameters. So, oh, come closer. <laughs> I really, I really hate to be glued to the mic. I'm, I'm sure I will be heard even in the back rows, but it will kind, it will be kind of more intimate and easier to interact. Thank you. This looks great. <laughs> so uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Serge Frolov, and um, I've lived in four different countries, Russia, Israel, California, and Texas, <laughs> which, is why, which is why I speak funny. You may have noticed it. I hope you will be able to understand me. If not, if, I mean, if you have some kind of, uh, you know, content question, just wait until the question and answer period, if we have one, if, I'm, if I don't run over the limit. Uh, other, if you have just a small question over, over something that I say, just raise your hand. There's no problem with that. Uh, yeah, now I cannot lose the jacket. I will lose the jacket anyway. What are jackets good for? Can you have fun? Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Never mind. Will be good on my shirt? Okay. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, I hate being glued to anything, including equipment. It's certainly to be bound by a jacket. Okay. I don't know what jackets are for, just to be pompous. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is how I usually teach. So I'm, my main specialty is uh, Hebrew Bible slash Tanakh slash Old Testament. And um, some of our discussion will actually reference that. Um, I also teach courses in Judaism, ancient Near East. And I also teach uh, some broader based uh, survey courses, one of which is Feminine Divine. Um, and uh, the presentation that I have just heard uh, looked like uh, it was kind of a condensation of maybe three lectures that I usually, three or four lectures that I usually give on ancient Egypt, and I recognized a lot of uh, what the presenter had to, had to say. Now, I have to warn, uh, for those who have been here previously, I have to warn, there will be, won't be that much of visual material because the culture that I, we are going to talk about about is uh, predominantly almost exclusively verbal and not visual. So we'll be, I'll be showing some text there, but there, there will be some diagrams and whatnot. So what are we talking about? And we are talking about, a, we are uh, attacking a different topic, and that is the topic of uh, feminine divine in a mon monotheistic tradition. A tradition that only recognizes one and only God. And that is the problem when it comes to gender. Because when you have a polytheistic religion, and believe it or not, just 2,500 years ago, all religions were polytheistic in, in one way or another. And the polytheistic religion is really easy. Of course, you have male and female deities. It is the reflection of the basic structure of life, basic structure of being, basic structure of existence, the universe as you know it, because it, and certainly a reflection of the basic structure of, of uh, any kind of human society. Now, some polytheistic deities may be asexual, some may be bisexual in the sense have having properties of the same sex and by the way the the creator god atom in the egyptian tradition was certainly both male and female because he produced the first gods by i mean he she his less she produced the first gods by by his or her own uh, some say mating with his shadow some say mating with his right hand i don't have to and decipher this reference. Uh, <laughs> but right, that, that is easy. In monotheistic religion, however, it becomes a problem. What is God's gender? Right. Of course, right, and here is the thing. You are, traditionally, it goes by the logic of a patriarchal society. 
And of course, in a patriarchal society, it is men who have, who have power. You need to have your genitals on the outside in order to be even considered to be any kind of ruler or had to have any kind of control, having any kind of domination. Uh, God, gods are generally supposed to have power over humans, but it is so much so, again, in monotheistic religions, because there is only one God. In polytheism, of course, there, uh, there is power play between gods. Gods may thwart each other, even defeat each other, even kill each other sometimes. And even if it is the chief god, like Zeus, for example, uh, other gods can do things behind his back, or cheat him, deceive him, or even even challenge him. That 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 happens as well. So, uh, but in monotheistic religion, of course, there is God, God having power. So, no problem with that. That comes together with the logic of the patriarchal society, and lo and behold, your God is male. And this is, on the face of it, this is how God is introduced in the foundational scriptures of, the, of all three monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, in the order of appearance. Um, the verbal forms uh, in Hebrew, verbs have, have uh, grammatical gender. Adjectives that are used with God's worship, which also have, have uh, grammatical gender, are all masculine, without any exception. God is metaphorically represented as a man, especially as a husband, his spouse being the humanity in general, or specifically the community of worshippers, the people of Israel in, in the Hebrew Bible. And it's not just a wife, it's a cheating wife. I mean, God has his own problems, <laughs> like, <laughs> which, which of course uh, wounds his pride and he promises to severely punish her, you know, honor killings, all this, all this stuff. Uh, 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 sometimes as a father, so God seems to be unmistakably, uh, unmistakably masculine, unmistakably male. And yet, it is also the fact that the same foundational scripture, the Hebrew Bible, also provides resources, textual resources, for a very different approach. And that is everything that all that happens with the Holy Scripture. My work definition of the Holy Scripture is a text where you can find justification for just about anything. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that is right. You see, I often hear from people, oh, the Scripture says, first of all, make sure that it really says that. But even if it really says that, it also says this. Yes, the, the scripture refers to God in, with masculine uh, pronouns and, and adjectives and verbs, but it also says this, right? And that is the very beginning of the Hebrew Bible, the very beginning of the whole Bible, right? The first chapter of, of the book of Genesis, which is the subject of so many culture wars these days, right? With cre creationism and whatnot. And I always say, now, why, why is everybody concentrating on this one chapter? There are 949 chapters in the Hebrew Bible. <laughs> Can we just forget about it? <laughs> but here is what it says. And God said, let us create humans in our image according to our likeness. So hey, human are like God. And let them have dominion over fish of the sea and birds of the sky and beasts and the whole land and over the swarming things that swarm on land. So, I mean, we are supposed to have dominion over creepy crawlies, right? Uh, now, now comes the important part right here. And God created humans in his image, right? Again, this is, the, this is what the Bible consists of, Hebrew Bible consistently said, God, right? A masculine pronouns, and you ca cannot be unambiguous. You cannot be ambiguous about this. Un unambiguously masculine pronoun. But in the image of God, He created them, male and female. He created them. Meaning, both 
male and female humans are in the image of God. And that provides space for you to think that God is both male and female, and that all these use of uh, masculine grammatical form is just a conventional use or conventional way of referring to something that is both male and female. I know a lot of languages and in a lot of them traditionally the mixed group of uh, men and women or males and females is referred to as in with masculine uh, grammatical forms. So which is also, also comes from the patriarchal society of course but which means, right, all these ways of speaking about God do not necessarily say that God is exclusively male. God, according to this God, may be both male and female. And this idea goes through the post-biblical tradition, ancient Israel, then, then the descendants of ancient Israel, the Jews, Judaism. Uh, but it especially flourishes in the Jewish mystical tradition, known as the Kabbalah. And the, the word Kabbalah simply, simply means tradition, period, but what we're talking about is the mystical tradition, Jewish mystical tradition. According to the Kabbalah itself, it, uh, it was created almost in its entirety by a rabbi who lived in the second century of the Common Era. His name was Shimon Bar Yochai. And uh, the legend goes he participated in an uprising against Romans. And when the uprising was suppressed, he had to hide for, I think, 40 years in a cave. And when he finally could emerge in, out of the cave, he started spouting all this, all this wisdom, all this uh, mystical Kabbalistic wisdom, which I say is not uh, surprising after 40 years in a cave. <laughs> You certainly ha might have a revelation or two here, there. Historically, although the roots of the Jewish mystical tradition indeed go back to the ancient times, and basically they go back actually to the Hebrew Bible, the Kabbalah as we know it, the so-called classical Kabbalah, it is medieval. And the main work of the classical Kabbalah, the book, well, it's called the book, but it's actually the whole shelf. Uh, called Zohar or Shining was in its entirety written by a rabbi who lived in the 12th century of the Common Era in the area that is now partly, partly in France, partly in Spain. So it's Provence and Catalonia basically, which kind of have, has very similar culture. And uh, that was a, a place of huge uh, you know, spiritual and theological ferment in the Middle Ages, especially on the Jewish side, but on Christian side as well. So, what does the Kabbalah say about God's gender? Ladies and gentlemen, I give you God. This is the diagram of God according to the Kabbalah. Now let me explain. First of all, this is not all there, there is about God, but this is all we can know about God. Because God as such, the Godhead, according to the Kabbalah, and that is uh, much in line with the mainstream Jewish tradition, uh, God, as such, is a typical monotheistic God, or what today a lot of people would uh, describe as great beyond. And, and when, when I first heard this term, I misheard it and said, great beyond. Uh, well, it, ki it, it kind of fits because it has no color, right? It's all gray. And this, and this, this is the great beyond as we usually understand it because I mean, the typical monotheistic God, you cannot say anything positive about this God. You cannot say um, uh, wh what this God is, right? You co only can say what this God is not, right? 
not, n not human, not, not an animal, not any kind of being, having no properties, ha certainly having no gender. This is one aspect of God according to the Kabbalah. Right? So something is called transcendent or unmanifest God. And this aspect of God is referred to in the Kabbalah is simply uh, is and so which is usually translated as the infinite, but even that is in wrong. That is wrong because the infinite is also already an attribute of God. And again, this aspect of God cannot have any attribute. So it doesn't mean, uh, literally doesn't mean the infinite, it means the infinity. But what is important, the God also has Immanent or manifest side, and that is, there it there it is. It is a system of ten interconnected entities that are known collectively as ten spherot. Sphera, pl plural is spherot, singular is sphera. Sphera simply means number. That is because all, all these entities are also identified with the first uh, 10 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, which double as numbers. So ju just, like, just like in Latin numerals. Uh, um, so if you look at the names, right, you can read the names right here. So and I will skip this for, for a moment. Understanding, wisdom, justice, loving kindness, or simply grace, glory, majesty, eternity. Right, it is all attributes of God. Right, so in part, these entities are simply emanations of God, right? God manifesting certain properties that can be perceived, can be understood, can be reached, can be described. But the, it is also a kind of bridge between God and the world. God is here and very appropriate, right? No color. The world is here, right? and these entities are a bridge between God and the world. See, they are all connected, except for this one. We'll talk about this connection or lack thereof in a moment. But they are, this is a bridge, or as they would especially emphasize in the Kabbalah, these are the channels that connect God to the world. Why is it important? Because it, it is a very interesting solution, by the way. It has, has no direct connection to the gender issue or feminine divine, but this is a kind of solution to the uh, problem of evil. Right. Where does evil come in this world if you have one God who is supposedly a benevolent God? Right. I mean, if you have only have one God, you want to believe that this God is benevolent, right? The all-powerful God who is not benevolent is the devil, right, to, to all practical purposes. So, th so well, then where does... Where is evil from in this world? And the Kabbalah says evil is actually the absence of good. And why can there be, there be an absence of good? Because this connection is broken. So God exudes blessing at all time. God is not responsible. <laughs> the problem is these channels can be clogged. Just like, well, and why can they be clogged? Because of the action that comes from below. When humans misbehave, such as, for example, Jews not following the commandments or generally doing evil, these channels become clogged. Just like, you know, when you flush something inappropriate down the toilet and then you have to call a plumber, right? Here is, it is, it is basi basically the same thing, only going upwards, right? So the thing is, right, when these channels work pro properly, and this has to do with feminine divine, the, the blessing is supposed to just to trickle down without any impediment. What clears these channels, again, is the action from, 
from below, such as following the commandments, doing good deeds, uh, praying, prayer, uh, prayer, and in uh, ancient times, sacrifice plays a huge role, especially if you think about the smoke of the sacrifice going up, 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 up. Now, one, why are we even talking about all this? Because unlike Ensof, unlike, unlike the transcendent God, these entities have gender. Some of them are male, some of them are female. And there are two different spatial arrangements with regard to this division into gender. One division, one boundary runs vertically. One side is male, another is female. Can you guess which one is male, which one is female? Hmm? Which one uh, on the right is? Female. Why do you think so? <laughs> Interesting, right? Um, bear in mind, the Kabbalah is still with all its interest towards um, the feminine, uh, general feminine, divine, in particular, still a product of a patriarchal society. And in a patriarchal society, as we, right, we all think in term in binaries, right? All our perception is in binaries, like up, down, hot, cold, right? Um, we, they, I, them, and so on, I, you, and so on, right? And in the binary, one side is always good and another is bad. So in the, binary, in the left, right binary, which side is, is good and which one is bad? <laughs> right side is good, <laughs> right? Correct, correct, right is, correct is right. right. Hear my wedding band? That's European tradition, right? Because right hand is the good, good hand, by the way, right? This is why lefties were always viewed with suspicion, right? Because right, right side is God's side, the left side is the devil's side. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> instead of just you know helping them to 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 use their their hands properly, they, like, oh, j try to do it with your right hand, right? So right, and another another stereotype that is associated with uh, with the uh, uh, patriarchal society, and that is you find in in a lot of religious traditions is that generally women are tougher than men, which is not so incorrect, I think, in, in some respects. But here is, here is the thing, right? Here, definitely the tough side, right? Justice, especially here, justice, right? And justice, it's not just justice, it's judgment, right? This is the female side. This side, is associated with grace, is male side. And actually, these, are, these two sides are associated with the main attributes of God, in the, not just in Kabbalah, in the mainstream Jewish tradition. There is, this is measure of grace, and this is measure of judgment. Right, so God, is, God has both, and these are respectively uh, male and female. And especially when you talk about this arrangement, this kind of vertical boundary running through it, the Kabbalistic um, mythology concentrates on these two entities, these two spheres of wisdom, which is male, which is called the father, and Bina understanding, which is called the mother. They are described as a perfect couple who are in who are together at all times, say, so, some examples from the book of Zohar. Never does the inclination of the father and the mother towards, toward each other cease. They always go out together and dwell together. They never separate and never leave each other. They are together in complete union. 
or the father and the mother, since they are found in union at all the time and are never hidden or separated from each other, are called companions, and they find satisfaction in permanent union. All right, and you might think, what kind of uh, union, what kind of satisfaction is there? It is uh, entirely spiritual or emotional or something like that. No, we are talking about sexual satisfaction as well. Here they have different names. I just put, put, put there in square break. So when the seed of the righteous is about to be ejaculated, he does not have to seek the female, for she abides with him, never leaves him, and is always in readiness for him. His seed flows not safe when the female is ready, and when they both as one desire each other, and they unite in a single embrace and never separate. Thus, thus the righteous is never forsaken. So. Within the Godhead, we don't just have male and female elements. These male and female elements actually have sex with each other. What does it achieve? It achieves God having sexual experience. Why is it important? because we want to relate to God. And to whom can we relate? To people who, to somebody who shares our experience. We want God to understand us. How can God understand us if God has never had sex? And that fills that void. Now, uh, sex very logically, sex very logically leads to children. Right? So I'm returning to this diagram. This is father, this is mother, and they have children. They have a boy and a girl who are full siblings and sometimes dis even described as, uh, as twins. So this is the son, Tiferet or Glory, and this is the daughter, Shehina or Divine Presence. Right? I've talked about the vertical arrangement right between God, the, this system serving as the bridge between God and the world, right? Of course, on top there is crown, right? This is the, the sphera that is closest to the transcendent God. And this is divine presence at the bottom. Why is it at the bottom? Because it is closer to the world, right? It's God's presence in the world. What, kind, what other kind of divine presence, e, presence is important here? But this, this, also, this arrangement also makes sense because these two entities, these two spherot, the male Tiferet and the female Shekhina, they are not just full brother and sister, they are also a couple, which again um, is very common in polytheistic religions. There was just a presentation on Egypt in this room, and the first several generations of gods in, according to Egyptian mythology, were full brothers and sisters, also couples, and had children. And the fam most famous couple, Isis and Osiris, they, they are not just full brother and sister, but actually twins. And some, some Egyptian myth says that they became a couple even before they were born. So go figure. Well, it's gods after all, right? It happens. So um, same thing here. They are a couple. And why does it make, on one level, why, why does it make one sense? Uh, on one level, why does it make sense for this to be? male and this to be female, because of sexual connection again, right? It is, it is the primary sexual position in just about every culture known as missionary position. And among other things, this is why Egypt is actually a big, big exception from this, but this is why actually the sky in all mythologies is always male and the earth is female. But we'll, we'll get to 
their, their relationship and their being a couple. Now, Shehina, right, from now on, we will uh, mostly concentrate on this particular sphere because this is, she is really an uh, uh, ultimate expression of the uh, feminine divine in the uh, Kabbalistic tradition. Now, how is, where am I on time? Ah, oh, not bad, not bad at all. So, uh, uh, how is Shehina uh, described in the Kabbalistic tradition, Kabbalistic mythology? I would say there are four main aspects of her description. One aspect, she is a virgin. She is referred to as a virgin, as a virgin spirit, something like that. Second, she is a mother. And you might say that these, these two things don't really go well together, but they do, right? Including in Christianity, for example. What? <laughs> it does. It does. And, and in a lot of polytheistic traditions as well. Virgin mothers are all over the ancient Near East, including Egypt, Mesopotamia, Syria, Palestine, ancient Asia Minor, and so on. So, virgin and mother, one, two, two. First aspect, third aspect, I would want to talk about a bit more. Uh, Shehina is described as a warrior, which is, uh, which may surprise you given the patriarchal society where warriors are usually men and um, uh, where women are usually kind of victims of war rather, rather than, or prizes of war, if you look from another angle. Uh, but uh, this is also common in polytheistic cultures. I mean, I um, stepped out, had to step out when, when our first previous presenter was talking about the Egyptian goddess Hathor. But she is the goddess of sexuality and all kinds of pleasure and enjoyment, but she is also the goddess of war. Or in Mesopotamia, Inanna or Ishtar, she is the goddess of sexuality, often compared to Aphrodite or Venus, but she is also something that not, neither Aphrodite or Venus are, and she is the goddess of war. So this is common. Now, when Shehina is described as a warrior, her image becomes terrible, becomes monstrous. She is described as a giant who can uh, eat a, a thousand mountains at one bite and drink a thousand rivers at one gulp. She has, um, she has claws, her hair, her, her hair is disheveled, she wields all kinds of weapons, she is accompanied by all kinds of monstrous creatures who are her army. So I, if, you th if you started thinking about the South, in South Asian uh, goddess Kali, very similar, very similar. Disheveled hair, claws, and uh, only, I mean, there are no, no garland of skulls around her hips, but that's, that's the only difference, probably. And by the way, again, uh, the classical Kabbalah comes from the 12th century. A medieval times, by that times, they, there was connection between Europe and India, so maybe there is, there is some influence coming, crime, coming from there as well. And again, much of Kabbalah is actually kind of running, but very disjointed commentary on the Hebrew Bible. And according to the Kabbalah, every time when in the Hebrew Bible God is described as waging war, and that happens all the time, that is that fighting, all, all, all of that fighting is actually done by Shehina. So she, she may be quite tough. Um, on the other hand, she is also, and that is probably the most uh, common description of Shehina in the Kabbalah, she is described as a lover. Now, whose lover? Um, well, almost everybody's. Let, let me explain. Now, Shehina is described as being irresistibly attracted 
to every pious man. That includes biblical characters, and there is a lot of pious heroes of piety in the Bible. With some it worked, with some it didn't. For example, Shekhinah had a thing for Jacob, who is the forefather of the people of Israel. He is the one who received the name Israel, but it didn't work out because Jacob had four wives, so he was preoccupied with them. It worked, it, however, very well, worked very well with Moses, so well that Moses even abandoned his wife, Zipporah, for the sake of Shekhinah. And that, by the way, again, is a very ingenious interpretation of the Bible, because if you read the book of Exodus, Moses had to escape from Egypt. He goes to live in Midian, uh, marries the, the daughter of the local priest, whose name is Zipporah, then returns through with her to Egypt to perform all the miracles and to let the, lead the people out. And then, then Zipporah disappears. She's never mentioned again. Where did she go? Kabbalah says, well, um, she had to go because Shekhinah was there. And Shekhinah also is said to have a thing or two with Solomon, but with Solomon the importance lies elsewhere. We'll get, to, get, get there in, in a second. Now, Shekhinah is also described as being attracted, actually, the word in the Kabbalah is clinging to the pious Jewish men who have to uh, spend years, sometimes decades, away from their families in order to study with famous rabbis. Now, it is, now, why is it important? Because unlike Christianity, at least as it was because before the Protestant churches came along, unlike Christianity, Judaism rejects any kind of asceticism and especially rejects any kind of celibacy. The general principle is that complete fulfillment can be only found in the family. Real blessing can be only found in the family. But then, again, the Jewish tradition also extols men who, for the sake of learning, go and study with famous rabbis, staying away from their wives for years, maybe even decades. Like the famous rabbi, he, can, he stayed away from his wife like for 40 years or something like that. So how can, can it be that these pious men remain unfulfilled? And the Kabbalistic answer is Shechina is their replacement wife. She is, they, as long as they stay away from their families, they are fulfilled with Shechina. But especially Shechina has a connection, as again I said, a couple with her brother, possibly br uh, twin brother, Tiferet. When Kabbalah talks about the relationship between these two, first of all, they get different names. Tiferet is referred to as Malka Kadisha, or Holy King. Uh, Shechina is referred to as Matranit, which is a kind of linguistic monster because it is a combination of the lat Latin word matron, which means married woman, especially aristocratic married woman, and the, he the Hebrew feminine suffix it. So it is kind of a legitimate construction, but this, uh, this, this is how it works. And when Kabbalah uh, talks about a relationship uh, within this couple, the uh, gender arrangement of this diagram changes. Instead of the boundary run running vertically, it runs horizontally and it runs here. Basically, Tiferet takes over these nine spherot, which begin to form a human body. So it becomes anthropomorphic. Brain, right eye, left eye, Right arm, left arm, heart, right leg, left leg. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you got it. Right? So it's not just a human body, it's not just anthropomorphic, it is very unmistakably a male body. Uh, now, um, According to the Kabbalah, 
this couple, they are generally madly in love with each other, and they become married when Solomon builds the temple in Jerusalem, temple of God in Jerusalem, which according to the Jewish tradition is the only rightful place to worship God. But the Kabbalah also describes this temple as the meeting place between Malka Kadisha and Matranit. And more specifically as the place where they have their sexual encounters. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I'll try to do it. I'll have to speak very, very fast. <laughs> um, Right? And so, some Kabbalistic sources say that it happens every day at midnight. Some say that it happens weekly on Friday night, which according to the Jewish tradition is the best time to have sex. So, um, so temple is the really, this is the role of Solomon in, with, with regard, the main role of Solomon with regard to Shekhinah. But even though these two are in... Uh, made love with each other, not everything is perfect in their relationship. The problem is this relationship is affected again but by the influences that come from the world, from humans, and especially from the people of Israel and the Jewish people. The problem is Malka Kadisha has a rival by the name of Samael, who is kind of Jew Jewish Satan, basically. This is a demonic supernatural demonic figure, and Samael uh, also lasts after Shechina or after, after Matranin, wants her for himself. As long as Jews follow the commandments, do the good deeds, he does not succeed. But when a transgression happens, Matranit loses the ability to resist, and Samael has her, basically kidnaps or you might say rapes her. But there is a way to bring her back, and that, is, that way is the scapegoat ritual that is described in the Bible. Heard about scapegoat, right? Everybody knows where, where the sca word scapegoat comes from, right? It's a ritual described in the Bible on the Day of Atonement annually. The high priest would put, symbolically put, all the transgressions of the people of Israel upon a goat, and then send the goat outside the perimeter of the inhabited lands into the desert, uh, desert and leave it there. The uh, Kabbalah explains this ritual as basically a way to distract Samael. So it is kind of sacrifice to Samael. Samael goes to collect the goat, leaves Matranit alone, and then she can escape and reunite with, with, her, with, with her true love. But that is, that, that is also kind of intermittent problem. But then the problem becomes more or less permanent, and that, is, that happens when the temple is destroyed. Now the uh, connection, the sexual connection between Malka Kadish and Matranit, between Tiferet and Shechina, is broken. They have no place to meet. And that is a problem. Why is it a problem? Because there is no connection here, right? There is no connection here. And this connection has to be sexual because, again, this is the sexual member. This is the man on top and this is uh, the woman on bottom, right? And why is, why is it important cosmically? Oh, that's loud. Why is it important cosmically? Because, again, the blessing from God cannot trickle down and the evil is the absence of this blessing from God. And that, according to the Kabbalah, is basically the state of affairs right now, and it will remain the state of affairs until the Messiah comes and rebuilds the temple. But Kabbalah has an important caveat, and that is this connection between these two entities, male and female, can be restored temporarily. How can it be restored temporarily? It can be restored temporarily by Jews observing commandments, doing good deeds, especially if it is uh, uh, accompanied by a special formula, 
uh, that says that these deeds is done to reunite the Holy One, blessed be He, with His Shekhinah in love and fear. That, for a moment, restores this connection and makes it possible for divine blessing to trickle down. And that is, by the way, graphically uh, reflected in a symbol that is certainly very familiar to you. Although this symbol comes from the Kabbalah, today it is very closely associated with Jews and Judaism in general. And here it is. It is everywhere you can see it if you go to the synagogue. It, it is on the national flag of the state of Israel. But this is a Kabbalistic symbol that uh, graphically shows to the extent that Jewish, Jewish tradition is generally against any images uh, based on second com very strict interpretation of the second commandment. Don't, don't create any likeness. But this is basically, right? the penis in the vagina. This is, again, the sexual connection between the male and female elements of the divine. So this is what the Kabbalah does. It brings the sorely missing and sorely missed female element into a monotheistic religion, even when it's so difficult to do just because of the very nature of monotheism and because of the uh, uh, patriarchal presuppositions. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, if you have any? Questions? Questions? Don't be shy. Feel free. Otherwise, oh. um, we are meeting back in the main room in about 15 minutes. So there is time uh -huh. if, if you'd like to stay for a little bit uh, for our closing session. So thank you, everyone, for coming. And, and thank you so much for your presentation. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, come here if you have something to ask. Or, or you can just do it right now. Huh? Please. In the Old Testament, it's not wisdom personified as yeah. female. I was saying that was here, here, that, that, that is an interesting thing, because in the Bible, actually, wisdom is described as female. She's almost kind of a girlfriend of God. And that is, the, in her, he actually becomes full-fledged girlfriend of God in the Gnostic tradition. But somehow, in the late antiquity, early Middle Ages, it shifts. You know, this, this, this uh, famous mosque, now it is a mosque in, in Istanbul which used to be a Christian church, which is called Hagia Sophia, which means holy wisdom. And who is holy wisdom? Jesus. Who is not female, for all we know. <laughs> right, so so, so it, it shifts, but, but, but again, it, it, it uh, raises question about the, uh, about, again, about the feminine divine in, in, the, in the monotheistic traditions. The way I see it, all monotheistic traditions just, you know, just yearn for a, a, for a feminine element. They need it for any number of reasons, and they grasp in all directions to find it, such as, you know, Mary in, in a lot of branches of Christianity, right? In, I don't know, in some versions of Catholic Christianity, right, Mary is almost more important than Jesus, right? I mean, go to Mexico, right, it's, uh, or, or in Russian Orthodoxy. Uh, so, or, uh, or in, in, you know, Latter-day Latter Saints Mormonism, right, there, there is the Heavenly Mother, who, who is not even Mary. <laughs> so, yeah, it is, it is the, uh, you can't have a religion without feminine divine. That's because there are so many things that cannot, cannot just happen without it. 
How widely accepted is the Kabbalistic tradition in just general Judaism? Uh, well, uh, Kabbalah emerged on the fringe, and for some time it remained the fringe, and especially because it, um, it uh, generated a couple of pseudo-Messianic movements which did a lot of harm to the Jewish yes. population in general. A lot of rabbis were wary about it. Among other things, there was a prohibition uh, to uh, study um, Kabbalah uh, if you are younger than 40. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, there were other, and there were other conditions, such as being well-versed in the mainstream Jewish tradition and so on. But uh, starting in the 18th century, it barged into the mainstream big time with the birth of the Hasidic movement. Because Hasidic, the, the whole theology of Hasidic movement is strictly based on the Kabbalah. And, and now, these days, like between 70 and 90 percent of Orthodox Jews are Hasidic Jews. And uh, the concepts from Kabbalah also uh, kind of trickle even into non-Orthodox Judaism, such as, for example, the notion of uh, tikkun olam, the, the mending of the world as the, may, the primary responsibility of Jews and humans in general. That is a Kabbalistic concept, but today Reformed Jews would embrace it with, with both arms. So yeah, now, now um, I, I mean, I mean yeah, Jew, Jews are generally very disagreeable bunch, so <laughs> I mean, I always tell my students, you know, with all these ideas about the worldwide Jewish conspiracy are nonsense because <laughs> those people just don't know how d difficult it is for Jews to agree on anything. <laughs> so, so uh, and that is healthy, I think. So, so um, there might be, st might be still Jews that, you know, think that Kabbalah is kind of, kind of um, stupid superstitions or something like that. But it is really, it has been mainstreamed a lot in the, in the last um, 250 years, say. No, there, 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 there is an anecdote. So there was a, uh, there is a celebrated scholar of the Kabbalah, Gershon Sholem. Um, uh, he was still a young scholar, but already studying the Kabbalah, and he, he uh, has to speak at a conference, and when he comes to, to, to the room, he sees that the meeting is presided by Saul Lieberman, who, a Jewish historian, who was known to think that all Kabbalah is complete BS. Mm -hmm. So Sholem <laughs> somehow delivers his paper, then he sees uh, Lieberman stand up, and then he hears Lieberman say, now we know that nonsense is nonsense, but the science of noise, nonsense is science. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Somebody wanted to? Well, ah, I yeah. just wondered about, I read that Michelangelo was heavily influenced by Kabbalah's teaching. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's, a, that's another interest, interesting uh, aspect of it because uh, some Christians were heavily influenced by the Kabbalah and there is, there is even such thing as Christian Kabbalah, which is based on Jewish Kabbalah but with, with tweaks, of course. And so, yeah, it was, it was popular among some Christians in some places during the Renaissance period. It was, it was kind of trendy, and it especially became trendy in uh, late 19th, early 20th century in different kinds of Europe. It was kind of part of the new age of that time, which is, I mean, all the, you know, uh, trendy educated people were into Kabbalah. They were, you know, drawing all these diagrams and whatnot. Yeah. <laughs> it was called Theosophy, the, the wisdom of God. SMU. SMU. Uh, that was fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you.